Lessons and Learning. I am the president of the National Test Prep Association, which is a national nonprofit that advocates for the responsible administration and use of standardized testing. Um, in that capacity, I interface with College Board and ACT. I'm also a consulting trainer for ACT. Um, I'm the founder of TestBright, a company we license curriculum to uh, providers all over the country. Basically, I wear a lot of hats in this industry. My most recent project is that we launched the Greater Rochester Getting Into College Fair. We had our first one. I don't know if you heard about it. It was at the Pittsburgh Library at the beginning of the month. It's a free three-hour event. We have one coming up on November 3rd at the Parent and Community Center. And the array of topics we'll be talking about uh, covers everything from how to pay for school, how to get into school, how to survive when you get there. And I'll be talking a little bit more about test optional than I will be tonight. But let's get down and talk about the SAT and ACT because there's a lot to know. The process by which students uh, prepare for school, apply to school, their chances of getting into college have changed so much over the last five years. Really, we've seen more change in testing and admissions than we have over the previous 35 years. We're at an interesting point regarding the SAT and ACT. And my splash screen, I hope that uh, some of you noticed with fondness, the uh, Rock'em Sock'em Robots. And I like to use that image to describe or depict the way that College Board and ACT are kind of duking it out to be the number one admissions test. And while that seems like inside baseball, it's useful to note how the two tests influence each other how the two tests are influenced by colleges. Every change that the tests make is often triggered by a request that they've received from colleges to provide different information about incoming students and how changes to the SAT and ACT influence American education. So we watch these tests very carefully because they give us a lot of signals about what's happening in uh, the world. And it's interesting to note that right now, the SAT and ACT have never been more similar. They really are testing for this year much of the same information. They um, and we'll be going over that information, and you'll see how the SAT and ACT test a lot of the same fundamental information in the same ways. What's also interesting and maybe different for those of you who have gone through the process and remember that you chose one of the two tests based on where you grew up or where you were applying to school, is that today schools accept bo both tests equally. That's important because while the tests are very similar, there are some differences that we'll talk about. And as we describe the two exams, think about your son, your daughter, and who might really benefit from a given test. And we'll talk at a certain point about how you can tell which test will be better for you. But keep in mind, schools accept both tests equally. The two tests have never been more similar than they are right now. They will also never be more similar again. So if you're the parent of a student in the class of 2025 or later, next spring, students will be contending with a digital SAT. The ACT will remain paper and pencil. The SAT is going entirely digital with an adaptive format. We'll get our first sneak preview of that um, here in the United States in October of next year for the PSAT. We will have more information about that when it's time to talk about it. But even students in the class of 2025 will have a chance to take the paper and pencil SAT before it goes all digital. They'll always have that ACT on paper and pencil, at least for the foreseeable future, that organization seems committed. So let's talk about the tests. What kind of skills do the SAT and ACT challenge from students? One of the main skills they challenge are reading skills. And in fact, every admissions test, those of you who went to graduate school or law school or business school, or even medical school know, reading is always on the docket. And that's because reading is a core learning skill and the SAT and ACT test the ability of students to read long form text in a variety of topics, mostly but not entirely nonfiction, under timed conditions. Students need to read the text and understand what 
authors write these articles or these passages to say, and then find evidence to ask to answer questions. It seems very straightforward. And if you were a natural reader, you would probably find it uh, easy and maybe even enjoyable. Our students, many of whom are not readers, don't find it that enjoyable. So we cultivate the idea that reading is a skill that is practicable and coachable, and it's a skill that pays off major dividends in college and in life. The SAT and ACT are similar in their current focus on these passages, and they're similar in that they do not test high-level vocabulary. The ACT never really did. College board, you may remember, you may have nightmares about analogies and sentence completions. That's not a thing right now. The future AC, the SAT may be swinging back to more advanced vocabulary, but right now the SAT and ACT test tier two vocabulary, more everyday functional vocabulary, which is still fairly challenging for our students. Uh, they don't need to get into the esoteric SAT words. What the two exams do test and prioritize as really the 21st century equivalent to a college level vocabulary are graphical literacy skills. Our students' ability to read and understand the implications of graphs, charts, tables, and figures has always been tested on the ACT in the form of the science section, right? If you heard that the, science, that the ACT has a science section, you heard right. If you heard that it requires a lot of science knowledge, that's not accurate. Students don't need a ton of science knowledge. They do need science reasoning. They need to understand the scientific method and experimental design and how to compare models, but mainly they need healthy strength in graphical literacy. The SAT also tests graphs. The SAT includes graphs on the reading section, on the writing and language section, on the math section, students will see graphs everywhere. The SAT and ACT test grammar. They test the conventions of standard written English, the ability to write clear, concise, appropriate sentences. And that is not a skill that a lot of students have on a mechanical level. Not that we don't have students that are great writers, but Many students look like deers, a deer caught in headlights when you ask them to connect the subject and the predicate or explain to you the rules of how to use certain commas or even what a preposition is. So that was a big push um, you know, 15, 20 years ago from colleges. They said, listen, we need better ways to evaluate students' ability to write. And so we have the multiple choice sections of the SAT and ACT, which are currently practically identical. The main difference between the two is that the SAT writing and language section offers students a lot more time than the ACT English section. The ACT is what they call a speeded test. SAT gives a little more time on the verbal questions. The math sections of the two tests are also similar in the content that's tested. And many people focus on the highest level of math that's necessary for success on the exams. That is algebra two and trigonometry. So students on the standard track take algebra two trig in junior year and having at least a few months of that under their belt will help on the SAT and ACT. What's important to recognize is that the tests challenge lots of math that students have learned much earlier in their academic career. So we look at the highest level of math, but the range begins in the early grades when students are learning their basic operations. And students who are really strong with algebra two trig, but forget how to say add fractions, can lose points just as easily as the students that are not accelerated. And when we talk about acceleration, students that are already in Calc BC in junior year find themselves very far from the math that's actually tested on the exam. So a lot of preparing for the test has to do with remembering fundamentals and special rules from arithmetic, algebra, geometry, statistics, which is a growing category that's tested, and some trigonometry as well. Also, the SAT and ACT test math in more conceptual ways than students are often used to, 
They test math holistically where any given problem could call for multiple diverse applications of content or operations. And there is a very strong problem solving component. When I mentioned before that students don't really love reading, well, they also don't love reading word problems. There's a lot of reading throughout both, uh, all, both tests on all sections, including math. And students have lots of word problems where they have to be comfortable translating math to uh, translating English to math and coming up with good strategies. The two tests are very similar, except at the top end. So when you get to the most advanced or rare topics on the ACT, they will differ from the ones that you'll see in the SAT. The ACT will test matrices or vectors or logarithms. The SAT focuses on certain aspects of parabolas, other aspects of statistics that you don't see on the ACT. But the bulk of it is the same. One major difference is that students are permitted to use a calculator, a full graphing calculator that is not zeroed out on every question on the math section. The SAT does have a section where students are allowed to use a calculator on every question, but the SAT also has a section where students may not use a calculator. So mental math, comfort with mental math and fundamental multiplication and operations is important on the SAT. The SAT and ACT in the old days did not have an essay. There was no writing sample for a period of more than 10 years. There was an essay on both of them, optional on the ACT, mandatory on the SAT. Today, there is no essay on the SAT. There is an optional essay on the ACT and no college in the country except for West Point asks for it. So if your students are not applying to a military service academy, you don't have to worry about the essay. And that's all we'll say about it. Let's talk about scoring. Um, any questions so far? I know I'm speaking very quickly. There's so much more to share. <laughs> so be sure to ask questions and we'll have time for more. But to talk about the scoring, I just want you to be comfortable with the idea of how this standardized test is scored. Like any standardized test, these exams calculate a raw score, which is then converted to an arbitrary scale. The scale is different for each of the tests, but both of them calculate raw scores the same way. And that is through rights only scoring, which means that for every question on the test, no matter how easy it's considered, how difficult it's considered, and there's certainly a range on all the sections, students receive one point for every correct answer. Students don't lose anything for leaving a question blank. Students don't lose anything for getting a question wrong. Points are only granted for correct answers. But right there, there's a strategy for students, and it's one of many, which is never leave a question blank. Students should always guess they have nothing to lose and everything to gain. And there's tremendous benefit to um, using strategic guessing, getting rid of the choices that you don't need. All right. Let's talk about the different scales. ACT is still less popular than the SAT. So I like to start there with the 1 to 36 scale of the ACT. There are four sections that students take on test day. They take English, math, reading, and science, and they receive a one to 36 scaled score for each of those sections. Those section scores are averaged, rounding rules are applied, and that produces the ACT composite. The ACT composite of one to 36 has an average score, a 50th percentile score between 20 and 21. Uh, there are other pieces of information that students will receive on their score report. They'll see a STEM score and ELA score. They'll receive reporting category scores, which are subscores. And colleges don't look at any of those numbers. The only numbers colleges care about are the four section scores and the composite score. The SAT has a more familiar 400 to 1600 scale. And that's determined from different permutations or calculations with the four section scores. The first two sections of the SAT are the reading and then the writing and language. 
students receive a 10 to 40 score for each of those sections, which is added together, multiplied by 10 to produce a 200 to 800 evidence-based reading rating. It's what we used to call a verbal score, and I wish that we still did, but we'll call it EBRW. The math score is derived from all of the points from math no calculator and math calculator and scaled to its own 200 to 800 score. Those are added together. You can ignore the test, the cross test scores, the sub scores, any of that information. All we really want to look at are a student's section scores, composite scores, and percentiles. Now, what does your percentile tell you? Well, it tells you a couple of really important pieces of information. The first thing your percentile score tells you is how you rank against the entire cohort of test takers in a given year. So if 2 million students take an SAT in a given year and you score in the 76th percentile, that means your test score is better than or equal to 76% of the testing population. That's valuable to know because selective schools are looking for much higher percentiles. Another benefit of looking at students' percentile scores is to track progress. If a student starts uh, his or her journey on the test in the 50th percentile and they work their way up to 20 to a 70th percentile score, you can trust that a 20 percentile score increase is substantial and be proud of the effort. A third major benefit of percentiles is that they allow us to compare tests. We can compare an SAT and an ACT and find the concordance based on the percentiles ranks that they share. So if a student scores a 30 on the ACT, that is roughly 94th percentile. It's all approximate because the scales shift a little bit year by year. Um, and that is roughly equal to a 1370 or any score within the range of 1360 to 1380. There's value there because if a student has a big difference in one of these tests, 10 percentile points or more is definitely worth leading with and hiding the other one. When scores are two to three percentile points apart, that's statistical noise. It doesn't really matter. Now, the PSAT um, in other districts, the pre-ACT, but not in Brighton, are preliminary tests. And students take the PSAT in October of junior year, and that has no bearing on college admissions. It's great practice if that's what you're looking for. You get your scores in December, and it's a good indicator of how you're going to do on the SAT. Um, and the PSAT is the National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test. The 11th grade test is the first step in the National Merit Scholarship process, which is extremely competitive in New York. The selection index changes uh, year to year and it varies by state. New York is a very competitive state, which means that students need to score in the 99th percentile to hope to be in the National Merit Scholarship process, which I mean, the scholarship doesn't carry a lot of money, even if you make it that far. But there are a lot of other scholarships uh, linked to the National Merit Corporations, always worth families checking that website out and seeing uh, what's possible. So how do you choose? OK, I have said a bit about the SAT. I've said a bit about the ACT. And there is an easy way to get it to figure out if a student might have an advantage on one of these tests. And there's an accurate way. Sadly, the two are rarely the same. The easy way is to think about a student's strengths. If a student is a really strong reader, she always has her nose in a book, she's a fast reader, she's an AP Lang, AP Lit, A Push, um, there's a good chance that this student will do well on the ACT, which definitely rewards strong reading comprehension and speed, okay? Science reasoning is also a big thing. You don't have to have experience with all the sciences uh, on the high school level, but you do have to be comfortable with reading graphs and understanding wow. experimental design. If a student struggles in math, but is studious, is a hard worker, he'll often find the ACT a great representation of his best abilities because math is like little more than a quarter of the ACT score. There's the math section, which is 25%, and a tiny bit of math on the science section. 
The SAT, on the other hand, is ideal for students who find math to be their strength. When math is your strength, especially higher level algebra two skills, problem solving, looking for the shortcut, the strategic way to answer a question um, with or without a calculator, the SAT is there for you, especially if you're also a student who's kind of a slow reader, who needs more time on a reading or a grammar question. Math contributes 50% to the SAT score. It's very math forward. That's the easy way. You can tell from a profile when I'm talking to parents about their students, I usually have a recommendation, even if that recommendation is probably both, because lots of students, I would say easily half of students, score pretty close on both tests. But when there's an advantage, you want to exploit it. And you can often determine that advantage more directly by having students take these tests in practice. Not officially, it's a big waste of time to sit for an official exam just to find out how you're gonna do. If you're gonna sit for an official test, something that counts, prepare beforehand. But you can certainly take practice tests. Um, you can access free SAT, ACT tests that you can download and print. You can buy the official SAT study guide or the official ACT prep guide. Uh, students are always welcome to come to our proctored practice tests when we offer them. And I am just released a free video that will proctor it, an ACT auto proctor, where students can take a test in the comfort of their own homes. Um, and the SAT auto proctor may be coming out as early as tomorrow. So there's lots of options for students to practice. And I will give away the lead here. Practice is an essential part of getting ready for these exams. Now, why do the SAT and ACT matter? Is everybody, is everybody comfortable with the structure of the tests? Would you like me to assign some homework, uh, some practice sections, so you could really see the problems? Probably not. I never do that. Um, that's, that's for the students. The, for us, we just want to know why do these tests matter? What's the big deal anyway? Well, they matter because they are admissions tests, and that's all. They matter in the scope of college for admissions, for merit aid, the kind of scholarships that you don't have to pay back that are awarded on the basis of grades and test scores. They matter in some instances, not because you're trying to get into a highly selective school, but you just wanna know if your teen is ready for college level work. Um, in that sense, the SAT and ACT operate kind of like driver's tests where you wanna know if a student hits a readiness benchmark where you feel confident that there's at least a 75% chance or better that they will pass college algebra or English 101. We also look at the tests today in a test optional environment because there are still lots of advantages at lots of schools for submitting test scores, even if they're not required. So an important element of strategizing, will I take a test and do I have to submit it, is to recognize that there's a lot more latitude, a lot more sanity these days when it comes to score requirements from schools in that schools don't necessarily want to see every test a student has ever taken. There are a handful of schools among the most selective that want all scores sent. If student takes the SAT twice, they want to see both. If the student takes the ACT three times, they want to see them all. They say they're not going to evaluate those tests without bias. I still say better to take a test that you've prepared for and not take a test cold for your permanent record. But there are a lot of schools, most schools these days, have policies that reward testing multiple times. Okay, A lot of schools have what's called score choice which is quite simply, you can choose which score to send. You have to send whole day administrations. You can't just send sections. But if you take the SAT in December and March and you do better in March, you never have to even suggest that you took the test in December. You just send your March score, they're happy with it. If you take the SAT and the ACT and you were better on the ACT, you never send the SAT, you just send the ACT. That's a policy at a lot of schools. Many others have an even better option, which is called super scoring. And super scoring is great because these schools say, no matter how many times you test, 
we're not going to penalize you. We want to see your best possible score made up from your best sections. So if a student takes the SAT in December and does better in evidence-based reading writing, takes the SAT again in March and does better on math, a school that super scores the SAT will accept, send both of those tests and they will put together a better score than either one was naturally and evaluate it without bias. For schools that super score the ACT, it's even better. You can put together from, you could take four different tests and send your best English, your best math, your best reading, your best science. You're still sending the full tests, but the schools are picking that information out and using it to your advantage. Now, I guess a question that many of you may have is, how do you know if a school does this? And every school decides how it's going to evaluate scores. And those policies change sometimes year to year. You know, So there's lots of change. And the best way to find out is to do the research now. You're going to be doing research anyway. You're going to be looking up those middle 50 25th percentile to 75th percentile score ranges, and you can check Naviance for that information. You can go to an individual school's admissions page, and they'll have information about incoming freshmen and what their score policies are. If you and your teen are really serious about a school, have the teen call the school. Don't you make the call. Have the teen call the school speak to an admissions rep or speak to one of the admissions reps when they're visiting Brighton and ask the question directly. What is your current policy regarding SAT and ACT scores? Are you score choice? Do you super score the SAT? Do you super score the ACT? It's a lot of benefit to making yourself known to representatives of schools that you are interested in because demonstrated interest comes from all of those interactions. Now, <clears throat> There are lots of questions about test optional. And test optional is a term we use for a policy that has existed for a long time, but certainly not like it has for the last three years. All right. So the first thing to say is test optional admissions is not the same as test blind admissions. You may have heard of University of California system going test blind. The University of California system or the California State University system will not even accept test scores. Student can earn a perfect SAT, they won't look at that test for admissions. They are test blind. There are a couple of liberal arts schools across the country that are test blind. For the most part, what you hear is test optional. And almost all schools today are test optional. That's very different than it was two years ago. And the prediction is it's very different than what it's going to be two years from now. But right now, we're in a moment where everybody, parents, counselors, independent educational consultants, uh, everybody is trying to do the calculus to understand what does test optional mean. And I'll be honest when I say, nobody knows for sure what it means because you have to look at data and you have to parse the information to see how optional are the tests. Let's put aside certain factors, right? Open admit schools, community colleges, Schools that accept 75% or more of applicants. There's a question in the chat about art schools, right? Schools that are portfolio driven, they de-emphasize test scores, right? If you're applying to an art school, your portfolio is the leading piece of your application. Your grades matter. Lots of things matter. Your test scores may matter, especially for highly selective schools. But for the most part, the portfolio is what matters. The audition, if you're going to, you know, if you are a musician, that matters. Everyone else falls into this big category of undifferentiated to a certain extent and trying to gain advantage in selective admissions. And selective admissions today is more selective than ever. Um, schools that were 10% uh, had 10% acceptance rates pre-COVID are down to 4%. Um, I won't name names, but all the names you know are more selective now than they were before. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that they're just receiving way more applications than ever before. And they didn't change the number of seats and they're receiving that number of applications because of test optional admissions. That benefits the schools, that benefits some classes of student, it puts everyone else at a disadvantage. So who 
benefits from test optional admissions? Mostly the same groups that have always benefited. I think we all understand that there has been latitude in the admissions process, even in the Ivy Leagues and certain students um, got in. Um, I can think of some famous presidents and sons of celebrities who got into schools and were not carried by their grades. Think about some of the different groups. The main group that benefits from test optional admissions are underrepresented groups, meaning that every college is putting together not just a class, but a community. And it's extremely important for everyone involved that the campus is full of the richest, most diverse groups of viewpoints and backgrounds possible. So there's all different ways to explore the kind of groups that schools want to bring on. I like to think about geography because that's one element that we tend to overlook. But if you were, say, in the admissions office of Cornell, you would have your pick of New Yorkers, right? Cornell is our upstate Ivy, and certainly lots of Brighton students go, um, students from all over Monroe County, all over New York, have no problem getting into Cornell, and a big group of students attend there. But what about students from like North Dakota, right? How many students are applying to North Dakota? I've known people who have used that opportunity because if you're applying from North Dakota, you may be the only one applying. And if it's important to the admissions office to have at least one student from every state, they're going to provide some latitude in looking at your test scores. This is what used to happen with athletes, where if an athlete was really recruited and could still make the NCAA cutoff, which is not a thing anymore, um, you know, they got in. But I think a lot of us found uh, how surprising it was that today in the test optional environment, Athletes are often the ones who are being asked to submit specific high test scores when their peers are not. So if you're the parent of an athlete, do the research. Um, we saw a lot of seniors scrambling. They thought they were accepted at schools and they were told they had to produce test scores. That's changed. Legacies have not changed yet. There's been a little backlash against the concept of legacy admissions, but today legacies tend to uh, enjoy a certain generosity of perspective. And that doesn't just go for children of alums, children of faculty, children of donors benefit from test optional admissions, full pay families benefit from admissions. Let's put the cynicism aside for a minute and talk about another group of students that really benefit from test optional admissions. And those are superior applicants. They are amazing in every other part of their application. The, they don't have any Bs on their GPA. They've got the academic rigor, the extracurriculars, the essays, the recommendations, the works. They just don't have that test score. Those are the kinds of students that tend to do extremely well in a test optional environment. Everything in the application besides grades is to a certain extent optional. It's an option to do extracurricular activities. It's optional to write a decent essay. Um, when you're talking about the highly selective schools, you do everything when you're going down some levels and there's some room, you can focus on what really shows you off to best effect. Um, the thing is, you wanna try to get numbers from schools about whether there's an advantage to submitting test scores. And it's hard to get that information from some schools. The first cycle after the world went test optional, um, a lot of schools released information about you know, the students that were accepted with tests, the students that were accepted without tests. And while some schools showed some parity, there are some schools that literally only 20% of students who attend there submit tests. There are a lot of other schools that are in the same test optional bucket where 80% or more of students who attend submitted tests. So you want to look at individual schools and see if there are advantages for test submitters, what's called a submitter advantage. Sometimes in the first year of this cycle, we saw, you know, there could be a 60%, a 160%, a 220% benefit to submitting. Things have changed a little bit. Over the last cycle, not as many schools shared 
whether they were requiring scores or not. Not so many schools said what their advantage was, but the schools that did release information showed there is a consistent submitter advantage at a lot of known schools. Again, it just means that the burden of research is on us. Every family now has to do more research than they did in the past because there's <laughs> the waters are murky, all right? Think also, and I'd like to point out that one of the reasons that tests are valuable if you are the parent of a student who will be going away to school is the statistical trend, <laughs> which has been consistent over a long period of time, that not even two thirds of students that attend four year school graduate after six years. That's the graduation rate. That's the National Student Clearinghouse longitudinal study. They were very excited last year that the average ticked up to 62.2. Now, depending on the class of school you attend, your odds could be better, right? If you attend a public four year or a private nonprofit four year, your odds are higher, but never higher than 78% um, uh, to graduate in six years. We want to make sure that when we're sending students off to embark on their higher education journeys, that they're ready for the ride. Let's talk about the tests. What can you do about them? Well, look at the SAT and ACT in a couple of ways, right? Schools value the SAT and ACT because they're the ranked academic standard. You can't rank students on GPAs because lots of students earn high test scores that you're aware of growing grade inflation, not necessarily in Brighton, but that doesn't make things fair because in other schools, other districts, that's possible. But in any case, it's impossible for schools to truly know, was that a from an easy teacher or a hard teacher? Were you challenged? Were you not challenged? Grades are the most important factor in admissions, 100%. Test scores help put the grades in context, provide a little more information when it's hard to differentiate. So they're ranked in the same way that students benefit from, you know, going to the playoffs and the championships in the sport, from being the leader in debates. Sorry about that. That's my dog. I think you're hearing it. <laughs> um, in all those instances, differentiation is valuable and test scores do that. So if you're competing, you practice. I think all of you who know who have students in sports, who have students who in art and craft and music, they put in lots of practice. And why wouldn't you, if you wanna do really well when it counts, you practice. There's all kinds of preparation available. And when it comes to prep, first people should, you want your kids to study for tests. Think about the kind of preparation that suits them best. Think about the kind of preparation that they use to excel in. I know every year I hear the same complaint from parents. I bought my daughter the A Push uh, book, the big Barron's book or a study guide at the beginning of the year. And I went back in March and it was still where I left it. Uh, this may have happened to some of you. Some kids will study on their own. They'll pick up the book and that's all they'll need. Some students will engage with um, I don't know how many of you know about Reddit, but if a student is an active participant in the SAT or ACT subreddit and they go through that process, there was a study a couple of years ago I wrote about it on the Chariot Learning blog. Basically, that population had the highest concentration of perfect scores in the world, like that group of students that affiliated with a group. So if you are an autodidact, you can prep. Uh, at a higher level than ever before. If you need a teacher, if you need a tutor, get it, get it. There's all different options out there. Also, plan. A bit of planning can make this entire journey so much easier for your family. I'm not just talking about your son or daughter, but you. Think about the timeline. The SAT and ACT are tested, are offered basically all year long, okay? So you've got, if you consider that a school year begins when the previous year ends, then the school year begins in July, right? And 
there is actually an ACT. You can see the months in red have ACTs, the months in teal have blue have SATs. There is a July ACT, but it's not offered in New York State. And you guys may know New York schools let out way later than most other states. So this is early July. My experience is that our students who get out of uh, school in late June, they need at least a couple of weeks to take a break. Um, that said, there's an August SAT. It's at the end of August, right before Labor Day weekend. There's a September, like early to mid September ACT. These are tests that juniors and seniors alike can take. So I want to address the paradigm that used to exist. It was common wisdom that students would test at the end of junior year. And then if they needed to, they would prepare and take the test again in the beginning of senior year. That still works for a lot of students. You can test deep into senior year, at least into December of senior year, if you are not applying to competitive or highly selective schools, if you're not going early action, if you're trying to chase certain scores for scholarship. But the kinds of students that apply to highly selective schools are the kinds of students that are already burdened with lots of extracurricular and academic and sometimes even social or work commitments. And junior year, if you haven't gone through a full junior year with a teen yet, take my word for it, it just gets busier as it goes on. I think a lot of students started hitting the wall a couple of weeks ago, um, especially the ones that had to juggle um, playoffs for their fall sport, um, but it just gets tougher. So I find that a lot of students who have either already taken Algebra 2 or have other reasons to want to accelerate can prep over the summer and take the August and September tests, or they can take the October tests, or they can take the December tests. It's lots of reasons for juniors to see where in their schedules they can focus. Again, if they are the kinds of students that are taking AP exams and can't test in May, if they're the kind of students that are in spring sports and won't be able to test in June because crew, they're going to be crew, it's going to be baseball. If you look at the calendar and you look at your teen's activities and you think about what is a two to three month window where we can attack this challenge, it's just like seasons in a sport. Those of you who are parents of club athletes know what it's like. You, fig you finish one soccer season, the next soccer season begins, and then the next one begins. We go a season at a time because it's hard for people to sustain focus and intensity in one thing for longer than three or four months. And thus, if you can set your students up, plan a test date, say if I'm working to December, you know, you can start now. Ideally, you started a little earlier. If you don't get the score you want in December, you can take the February ACT, you can take the March SAT. It's always nice to look at that and realize that even if a student doesn't get the score he or she wants in junior year, even for early action, early decision, you have August, September, and the October SAT. The October ACT comes back too late for early decision, early action. But that leaves lots of options open. And again, like I said, for, you know, I've known athletes who were trying to place on a team where they were being recruited or families seeking certain scholarship bumps from higher scores that were able to test even into the spring of senior year. All right. I'm going to take a, a breath and ask for questions because that is the bulk of what we have to talk about tonight. What questions do you have about testing, timelines, admissions policies? Not all at once. You can either unmute or put them in the chat. And I see, you know, some of you have heard this before. And yeah, lots does change over time. This year, you know, the information that I shared about submitter advantages and test optional admissions is 
all the information that a large network of educators and admissions consultants have been able to piece together. We really are, in a sense, reading the tea leaves because we're not going to get a lot of straight answers about what's going to happen. I predict that we're going to continue to see lots of schools remain test optional because that benefits the school because it just increases admissions. Um, when students said there's a question about um, prepping at home and really one of the best ways to prep on your own is to use Khan Academy, use online programs. They're often very rich. Even YouTube has a whole lot of different videos. You know, if a student can learn that way, they often like to at least hear somebody explain a concept They might not be getting feedback. Another really important element of preparation, whether you're working on your own or working with someone else, is practice tests. And the tests that you're taking will not be Kaplan or Princeton or Barron's tests. They need to be official SAT tests, official ACT tests. There's a reason why the official SAT study guide sells millions of copies every year. And it's because it is a source of eight full length practice exams. Same thing for the official ACT prep guide. So if a student isn't taking practice tests, a student isn't really prepping. A student is studying, but that's, you know, like you're practicing golf by watching videos. Students have to do the work. Um, so can a student prep for the SAT after taking Algebra 2? After Algebra 2, there's no math left that's going to be tested on the exam. Anything, and the further they go, students in pre-calculus, students in uh, calculus, they're just getting farther away from what's tested. And you wouldn't believe how quickly those basic algebra skills, which are really, when it comes to important math, basic algebra, the ability to set up an equation and conduct inverse operations until you isolate the necessary variable, that's fundamental to both the SAT and ACT. Everything revolves around that. And if students are strong there, they have an advantage. That's where it is. So yes, students can. And a lot of times when I have spring athletes, when I'm counseling families with spring athletes, I'll, they'll probably test in December and March or December and February anyway, because even though a little more Algebra two under your belt might benefit you, trying to compete with APs and your main sport or activity is just too difficult. So again, what's most important is after you've established a certain fundamental level and an understanding of what you're going to be capable of, find the window of opportunity to keep the stress down. You know, that's the thing. People fear test anxiety and anxiety builds up when you have too much on your plate. And I think we all know that with teens, that if we can keep things manageable, junior year's challenging, um, we have, you know, we have such a rich environment in Brighton. Students are have so many different activities. And if you look at the calendars, like they're, they're all demanding and they're all overlapping if students really get after their interests and you've got to find the spots where students can focus on this piece too. And summer is also a great time to do it. Um, how many months of prep do I recommend? Again, I like to look at it as a season, okay? So two months, three months, four months, it really depends. Nice way to look at it, what you're doing is at least two months if possible before a specific test date, and that will take you to the next test date if you need to. Usually you'll get scores within 19 days of a test. Certain exams like the October ACT take longer to release them, but generally students know by the time they, you know, the December test scores are usually in before New Year's. So students can decide, okay, I'm going to take the February ACT. I'm going to take the March SAT and just continue. What I don't recommend is putting a lot of time into preparation and then taking a break, taking several months off. You would be surprised how even students that sustain preparation and they keep prepping after a few months, they start forgetting what they learned in the beginning of their process, even if they were applying that every week. Again, we are looking for intensity. Uh, it's kind of think about the way coaches do things. Um, they don't have you training and practicing 12 months a year. You have certain 
season where you are competitive and then you're just conditioning and conditioning i'd like to say especially for those of you with children in younger grades 10th grade ninth grade eighth grade even if you want them to be ready for testing naturally ready make sure their noses are in books all the time not just the books that are assigned for school but the books that they're interested in reading reading is a skill that gets better the more you do it if you enjoy what you're doing and it is the hardest skill to improve in the short term but for the students that acquire it over time doing things that always already like to do test preparation becomes a lot easier and more enjoyable PSAT scores I'm just going down a list of questions so it doesn't sound like I'm just jumping randomly from topic to topic PSAT scores are expected in December and the school will release them um so so okay this is a really interesting question about wanting to take the SAT or PSAT earlier to get students on college mailing lists. Nobody who's ever been on a college mailing list has ever said they wanted more mail from colleges. <laughs> the deluge of material that you that any student will get based on test scores uh, is overwhelming. Lots of attention from schools. By all means, you know, it's it's easy to get the attention of schools just being the right age will get attention certainly filling out applying for the psat the sat act they want to send you uh they they those organizations sell the information to colleges and they contact you um without being glib about it i would say you'd be much better off in control of that conversation rather than at the mercy of all of the schools that are going to contact you, which, you know, it's not very differentiated. And some schools have become very aggressive in pursuing candidates. Um, would I recommend taking the SAT before junior year? I rarely do. There are only certain instances where I'll recommend that. If a student is already going to finish Algebra II, or even pre-calculus in June in sophomore year. If a student is such a great prospect that coaches are already recruiting that student, if a student knows that he or she is going away for junior year, I've worked with students, um, you know, they were doing a year abroad in high school. This really happens. Like if there are reasons where a student won't be around, then sure. If a student, you know, I think that a lot of students, they think, well, I'm going to be at camp all summer. And then as soon as I get back, right to my sport, right to my activity, I would still want to see some academic maturity. Uh, that's one of the, like the math is important. The reading skills obviously are important, but there's also academic maturity because ideally a student tests and within that two to three month span, they get the score that everybody's happy with and they don't have to test again. I've seen some students that have done that at the end of sophomore year rarely a good case for anything before that. If you're concerned, contact me. I did have a student, I had a parent of a freshman. Um, I won't say the school um, or the student, but I'll just say that I told the parent, we don't work with freshmen for this. This is not appropriate. Um, and they prevailed on me to meet the student and the student was absolutely ready. She was absolutely ready to get her the extremely high test score she still put it off after a while and realized that she still couldn't, she would still rather wait a year. So you can counsel it, but junior year, even the beginning of junior year is great. Anything earlier than that is usually early, too early. Are there other, any other questions or did you all collaborate to time that perfectly for eight o'clock? <laughs> okay. Um, Philip Katzman asked a great question. What ways do the tests test executive functioning in every way? You think about the fact that these are tests of time management. They're tests of focus and attentiveness, prioritization, what you're going to do in the moment. Um, that's just the during the test itself. High levels of executive function are valuable in the prep process as well. And, um, you know, that ties into all kinds of concepts about study skills and metacognition. Uh, but I often say, you know, that the tests test reading, they test writing, they test math and problem solving, and they test executive function. So this, 
stronger a student is in that regard, the stronger a student is going to be in at least a diligent, organized approach to doing his or her best on the tests. All right, Mike, I really appreciate your time once again. Um, I'm going to stop the recording.